My discussion is going to be an overview of the ketogenic diet and its versions. We may be able to say a few things about dietary uh, considerations in reference to lifestyle and possibly how it might impact epilepsy. Uh, but we only have about 45 minutes and as you'll see when I get into this talk, uh, there's a lot that could be said about the diet. I continue to learn about this every day uh, and with some of the resources that I'll point out and you can go exploring, uh, you can find out a lot of the experiences of families that have been doing the diet that I actually learned from. Uh, to me, when I was a fellow, nobody mentioned anything about the diet. It was more like a theoretical consideration. And then, uh, even in the first several years of being in practice, and I've been, I've been in practice now for about 15 years, uh, it really wasn't anything that people would actually implement because very few places had the resources and the know-how to actually get this thing started. Um, even up until like the, only the past three years uh, at our institution, uh, have we started to be able to uh, deploy this as a, uh, a treatment option. Uh, and even in busy institutions, they uh, maybe get 20 patients a year on this. Uh, not as much because more patients are not perhaps candidates for the diet, but uh, there's uh, issues in being able to do the diet because much of it is not by, you know, I can give you a prescription to recommend the diet, but then ultimately the family has to be very involved and motivated to learn about it and stick with it. So we're going to give you a little background first about how this diet came about because there are people who are very unfamiliar with this and there's a lot of mythology that surrounds dietary therapy with epilepsy. Well, the idea that diet could affect seizures and epilepsy goes back thousands of years. Uh, even way back uh, in the Hippocratic writings of the 5th century BC, uh, there was uh, remarks that uh, indicated that if you uh, have a, someone abstain from food and even drink, uh, then their seizures could be cleared away. Uh, these are just remarks that we find in the ancient writings that don't elaborate more. But in the Hippocratic writings in particular, they acknowledge that epilepsy was an illness in the brain, and it was not, didn't have any uh, mysticism or uh, spiritual connotations to it. Uh, and so back then, there was an understanding of its medical significance. Uh, then even uh, another Greek uh, physician, uh, which uh, his last name is about as easy to pronounce as mine, uh, Erasistratus, um, remarked, and this is way before uh, BC, okay, uh, one inclined to epilepsy should be made to fast without mercy and be put on short rations. Um, but of course, we don't have specifics on what they did, how long people would be made to fast. Um, and of course, flash forward, and we'll get to that in short order, uh, you don't have to make somebody miserable, and the fasting is much more uh, brief. Uh, there's no limitations on water, so you don't have to torture somebody to get this thing started. Um, then uh, one of my all-time uh, heroes, at least in the, in the field of uh, medicine, is uh, Galen, uh, a Roman physician, who uh, talked about all kinds of things in, in matters of health. Now, much of that uh, are, are not really true, uh, but they have a physiological foundation and, um, and no, no significant spiritual uh, link because uh, that was causing a lot of problems uh, for the last 2,000 years and people with epilepsy thinking that it's something spiritual or uh, uh, superstitious and pulling it away from its medical relevance. Uh, but he uh, talked about an attenuating diet. Um, and then even in the, in, in the Bible, in the New Testament, which this is often referred to, uh, to go talk about how epilepsy has been uh, mentioned in, in writings in the past. Um, so most people are familiar with the uh, the story of uh, Jesus curing a boy who had epilepsy. Uh, but then the story goes on to his disciples asking, well, how could he do it when their previous attempts wasn't really working out? And he remarked uh, in particular that nothing but prayer and fasting can get rid of this kind of condition. Okay. So this is not a new issue. Uh, however, uh, then for 2,000 years, people forgot a lot about the uh, these kinds of uh, writings, the Hippocratic writings, were all but forgotten. Uh, and then uh, we sink ourselves into the, uh, the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, uh, where we uh, did not make any progress with epilepsy. Uh, and it really wasn't until 1911, 
okay, where there was a substantial writing about uh, the ketogenic diet, and it wasn't even talked about in that sense. Uh, but this, uh, uh, these two physicians, uh, Guelpa and Marie, were French physicians, and they remarked that a detoxified diet that was really calorie restricted seemed to have a favorable impact with, uh, with seizures. Um, now, one little quick remark. Uh, your slide pack has is, is been a, a little bit updated since it's been submitted. But you can just follow along. Uh, I wouldn't be too worried about it. The text in there is a little small. Um, and you can sit back and relax and just kind of uh, go with the flow. And there'll be plenty of resources where you can look at some of this information and not worry about the slide packet so much. Uh, then a uh, more colorful history, uh, Benar McFadden was this uh, fitness guru at a time when there was no such thing as that. Uh, he started a publication called uh, Physical Culture that was quite popular at the time with uh, close to a million subscribers. And he uh, talked about a lot of things that uh, he had no uh, uh, experience or qualifications to talk about in matters of health. But a couple of things that he hit upon really uh, uh, were correct, but for incorrect reasons. And in particular, he talked about a combination of um, fasting could eliminate seizures, among many other medical problems. Uh, but we would have not really remembered him much had it not been for another uh, individual, Dr. Hugh Conklin, who is actually just an assistant to this guy, who, um, uh, among other things, uh, picked up on this issue of epilepsy and fasting. And I'll uh, read it from here because it's quite humorous. Uh, in the first part, it seems pretty reasonable, where he says epilepsy may be cured by fasting. Uh, Dr. Hugh Conklin told the 26th Annual Convention of the American Osteopathic Association, which is one of the first public uh, legitimization of this possible diet. Uh, that's where things started to take off. Uh, Dr. Conklin, uh, according to him, uh, thought that uh, epilepsy is caused by improper functioning of certain glands in the bowels. And by fasting for 22 days, taking only water, uh, a cure may be had. Uh, you can go on reading the rest, which is uh, the, the patients that he picked out. And of course, it's not really caused by the bowels. Uh, but the uh, other individuals started to look at the diet because they, at this time, uh, when you go through the literature, just about everything is being tried for epilepsy as well as other medical problems. And uh, a lot of the literature is just sequential mentioning of anecdotal reports of what people are trying. And when something looks like it might uh, be substantial, people go with it and they look into it a little bit more. And this was one of them. Uh, then Galen, uh, or I think that's the way it's pronounced, in 1921 reported the results of fasting from Conklin and McFadden and legitimized those results. Uh, at the same time, uh, 1921 was a pretty big year. Uh, uh, Wood Yacht and uh, discussed biochemical changes associated with a diet low in carbs and high in fats. Uh, Wilder in 1921 at Mayo Clinic really actually coined the, the, the word ketogenic diet um, and uh, proposed that the benefits uh, could be achieved if you just get to ketosis and you don't have to uh, continue such a harsh fasting regimen. Lennox and Stanley Cobb in 1928, uh, which were one of the big names in uh, the epilepsy, uh, world of epilepsy, uh, started publishing results, among many other uh, uh, researchers, about case series of patients uh, that they were looking at with fasting. However, uh, despite there was always already enough literature there that said, okay, this might work, uh, at least to try it out, uh, with uh, no major complications compared to what was available at the time otherwise. But at the time, there was only phenobarbital that was being used. Uh, and so people were starting to look at this diet. But then uh, over the next 50 plus years, a lot of the medications started coming out that were pretty effective. And the diet really just lost favor. People just didn't really uh, look into it. They didn't study it enough uh, until the early 1990s. Uh, and in particular, uh, with public awareness with the Trolley Foundation, which I'll uh, acknowledge uh, toward the end of the talk. So there are versions of the ketogenic diet, okay, but we're going to focus first on the ketogenic diet because that is what we have most data about uh, that supports its use and we have a better understanding of how it's deployed and how it's continued. Um, in the last, say, five to eight years, there 
are versions of the ketogenic diet that uh, basically attempt to liberalize its restriction to, and still be able to keep its effect. Just as an overview, what is the ketogenic diet? What you're trying to do is you are uh, stocking up on fat intake. Okay, normally in the average uh, you know, world diet, carbs are a, a big player. And the brain loves glucose for energy. And so it gets its glucose energy from carbs. Uh, but when you start restricting carbs in a major way, the brain will need energy otherwise, and it can use ketones. And ketones are being produced in a situation where it can only get energy from fat. Okay, so it's a high fat diet. Uh, particularly in long-train triglycerides, and up to 75, 80, and in the beginning up to 90% of the recommended caloric intake daily is by fat. Um, you want an adequate amount of protein, okay, uh, a gram per kilogram per day, uh, and then you really need to restrict the carbohydrates, which everybody is now becoming a little bit understanding about, partly because of the Atkins diet and what that does for people in terms of weight loss and what you can do when you restrict carbs. It's five to 10 grams a day, uh, in general, we look at ratios, and there's a lot of the, the, the buzz words for ratios, four to one, three to one, two to one, one to one. Uh, that really refers to fat, uh, uh, to protein combined with carbs. Uh, and then maintaining a diet like that actually mimics a lot of the biochemical changes associated with uh, starving yourself, okay? Which is mainly getting your body to produce ketones from fat and the brain utilizes those ketones for energy and no longer really uses the glucose. So I'm gonna go through some of the studies uh, that when you go through some of these studies, it's pretty compelling and convincing. So there's not a lot of controversy now in the health, um, uh, in our side of the street, that this is not useful. Uh, it's really been more the practical end of trying to deploy this and in some instances, uh, uh, families uh, may struggle to try to keep this uh, going. Uh, and they may drop out of the diet. Uh, the ma first major one uh, that really uh, was large scale was uh, Freeman at Johns Hopkins in 1998. Uh, and he took 150 children, age one to 16 years, uh, mean age of 5.3 years. Uh, and these were highly refractory kids. They were already at least on two um, medications for seizures. AED uh, means anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, and so, at three months, 83% of those uh, starting the diet remain on the diet, so the retention wasn't so bad. 34% uh, had greater than 90% decrease in uh, seizures. At six months, 71% were still on the diet. 32% had greater than 90% decrease in their seizures. At one year, 55% remained on the diet, and 27% had a greater than 90% decrease in seizure frequency. So what's key here, if you look at the greater than 90% seizure free rates, it's pretty consistent. So the diet continues to have an impact over time. And we've seen that in longer term studies, uh, and especially in those kids that respond well to it. Uh, unlike the experience with perhaps some of the medications where the efficacy sort of wanes over time in some individuals. In adults that, that started to be looked at in the last 10 years or more, um, in the, one of the first key studies was looking at 11 patients. Uh, mean age was 32.2 years, uh, age range 19 to 45. And uh, six patients had symptomatic partial epilepsy, which means that they understood the cause of the person's seizure. Um, and five patients had symptomatic generalized, uh, meaning they were having convulsions. Um, the anti-epileptic drugs were held constant. Um, seizure frequency at eight month follow-up was compared with the frequency from the baseline. And the results were that at eight months in follow-up, three patients had 90% seizure uh, frequency reduction, okay? Three patients had 50 to 89%, one patient had less than 50% uh, impact. Uh, four patients discontinued diet, two I believe were because it didn't quite have an impact, and another two say they, they really couldn't keep it up, okay? All seizure types seem to respond to the diet, and as we know now with um, the, uh, the literature, uh, there's no particular seizure type that the diet may not potentially work in. Um, more common uh, seizure disorders, like an adult who might have, say, partial onset seizure variety, uh, may not respond as well, but there are some people who do respond well, and that's why it may need to be a consideration. There are side effects, uh, at least uh, uh, in, in this particular study. 
common ones were constipation and some menstrual irregularities that are pointed out in, in the women. Most patients report a subjective improvement in concentration and awareness, which has been uh, something that has been observed in, even in kids who are on the diet that uh, they may have an approved uh, level of wakefulness. Some of that may be related to perhaps some uh, other medications that they may have been on that have been reduced in dose. And some may be the biochemical effects of the diet and how the brain uh, derives its energy. Uh, serum cholesterol and triglycerides had been increased, which we'll get to more in a minute. There have been more studies uh, over the years. Uh, uh, in all, there are hundreds of studies, uh, most of them small, uh, some of them looking at specific aspects of the diet. Uh, but I'm pointing out some that were uh, uh, giving us a little more confidence about the efficacy. Uh, Neil uh, in Lancet in 1998, I mean in 2008, uh, looked at four, 145 children, half on the ketogenic diet and half were uh, on a, their regular diet. Uh, the mean seizure frequency in the diet group fell by one third, and in the seizure frequency in the control group got worse, as uh, not surprising necessarily. Uh, Kossoff uh, in uh, 2009 uh, found that seizure frequency was reduced by more than 50% in half the patients and more than 90% in a third of the patients. So again, we're getting consistent efficacy um, and as uh, we talk more and more about uh, some of these studies, uh, we just don't know who it's going to work best in, with some exceptions. And in other situations, we just have to try it, just like medications are tried, and we just give it time and see if it works. Uh, a little bit about the biochemistry about the diet, for those people who are interested more about the biochemistry. <laughs> um, we know that, uh, we just mentioned that the diet results in formation of ketone bodies. Uh, we're not really sure entirely if the ketones really is, uh, it has an anti-epileptic property or anti-seizure effect, um, but some kids who have had high ketones still may not be responding to the diet, and other kids whose ketone levels weren't all that high uh, may have had good responses. So ketones are uh, looked upon as a sort of a measure that the person is adequately on the diet. And uh, most uh, centers like to uh, uh, see high ketone levels uh, to ensure that the person is uh, uh, immersed in the diet adequately. Uh, we think that if someone is not responding with ketones that are pretty generous, when you check it with uh, the, the urine dipstick, the keto stick, um, then we know that they're not responding. And there's no question about it's not, it's the diet is just not working. Um, interestingly, the ketones are actually similar to GABA, which is an inhibitory neurochemical. Um, if you throw tons of GABA to the brain, uh, you can uh, uh, reduce a lot of seizures, but you also make the person sedated. Uh, and that's why GABA is not all the best. Uh, and, but it's similar to uh, GABA in that way uh, as an inhibitory effect on seizures. Okay, this, is, uh, this slide is not in your packet. Uh, and I, I put it in there for completeness sake. It's really a laundry list of what we need to do before we even get the diet started. Uh, if we're gonna do the diet, I really talk to uh, the patient in my clinic as an outpatient visit, explain to them uh, about the diet. I give them things to read about. There, we have books that they can go through. Um, sometimes, in some cases, they may wanna talk to parents who have tried it um, to give them a background and see what their interest might be. Uh, but these are the things that uh, I need to know about, as well as the, whoever is the treating physician, because if the diet is going to be um, started, you need to do all this preliminary evaluation and blood work to make sure that things are okay at baseline. Some of this is to screen for conditions that would be contraindicated with the diet. Uh, once a person is adequately screened and it looks like they're a good candidate, they don't have a uh, disorder uh, that would contraindicate the diet, particularly in uh, some of the genetic disorders uh, about fat utilization, uh, which I'll show uh, another chart shortly. Uh, the, how this thing is implemented or the diet varies considerably from institutions to institutions. There have been consensus statements about how to get this started. But it varies partly based on the preference of the physician, the dietary services, uh, the hospital experiences, uh, particularly even if the family. Um, but so I can give you just general ideas of how some, uh, some people do it. Uh, a lot of patients will admit to the hospital for some period of time, four to five days. Uh, there's a period of fasting for most institutions, anywhere from 12 to 48 hours, usually 
now uh, no more than 24 hours. And the trend is becoming trying to uh, institute the diet with minimal fasting period. Um, during that time in the hospital, the family's taught how to uh, uh, weigh out meals. And you're, you're taught enough to get this thing started. But one of the resources uh, that uh, I'll point you to is the Charlie Foundation website. And they have a link uh, for articles, um, even uh, uh, things that are uh, quite uh, readable and user-friendly. Uh, and even in, uh, most helpful is uh, this frequently asked questions where uh, it's uh, categorized in different topics, so you don't have to go through pages and pages of blogs to try to get in information. But some of the things that I kind of read through and I learn about, because there are very particular things that just really relate to an individual uh, parent's child or a patient that maybe doesn't translate to other families. Uh, there's no change in the anti-epileptic drugs in the beginning, um, mainly because we need time to see what the diet will do for the seizures. Some people report improvement in seizures as early within the, in the first couple of weeks, but it could take three, maybe even six months to actually see the improvement. Uh, in that time, you're talking about a child that may be seizing quite a bit or even an adult, so the medicines that they're going to be on, that doesn't necessarily mean we can't adjust them. I mean, if somebody's having side effects from, say, a drug that they're on, I'm going to have to work on that too. Uh, vitamins are supplemented. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that's not in your chart, but just more for re reference. These are the supplementations that are considered, and some of these are uh, standard when you're starting uh, these kinds of diets because uh, the diet is just not enriched enough for, uh, to cover your, uh, your vitamins, uh, in particular calcium. And we'll get to uh, potential long-term consequences of the diet shortly. Uh, but these are things that are just incorporated into the diet. Um, and there are other ones that are really based on individualized uh, uh, situations. Well, these are the possible adverse effects. Um, constipation is fairly common, and that's dealt with uh, dietary manipulation, uh, laxatives, and, uh, and things like that. It really is individualized. Kidney stones can happen. Uh, that's uh, part of the way to surveillance that is you can have kidney stones without any symptoms, obviously forming. So at subsequent visits, uh, which is, could vary from uh, three, four months, follow-ups, uh, there's a battery of labs and uh, your analysis is done to kind of screen for things that might uh, indicate problems that might be happening. There is often slowed growth rate, okay? And if that's detected based on the growth chart, um, you try to uh, incorporate uh, more calories, uh, as best you can, but there's a lot of times some slow growth rate inevitably. Uh, hypercholesterolemia, although interestingly in the studies looking at long term, it's not that much. Uh, and if it is, uh, you try to balance it out in the, in the diet, uh, but it hasn't been that much of a problem as much as people would have expected. Uh, the same with uh, triglycerides. Uh, your HDL has not particularly changed much. Uh, unfortunately, because the HDL is the good cholesterol that people really want, <laughs> uh, but it's not reduced. Uh, and pancreatitis is, uh, uh, lurks as a rare possibility. These are the contraindications for the diet. Uh, these are very rare conditions. These are genetic uh, disorders associated with epilepsy. Um, we're not going to go through all of these, uh, but these are conditions that we screen for in the baseline evaluation. And some of these conditions have already been picked up on even in infancy. Uh, in a child who has failure to thrive, uh, lethargy, um, has metabolic problems, uh, these would have been detected and we know not to uh, put the diet on. Now relative contraindications are really anticipated impossibilities in doing the diet. Um, I try to remind myself that I, I don't want the diet be limited because of anything on my end. So I, you know, there are some things I know, like if a family is just not in an obvious position to be able to do the diet, I may not necessarily offer it, okay? But I try to give families the benefit of the doubt and, and mention it and let the family then decide if this is doable for them rather than me decide and try to project my own feelings of limitation onto them. The other thing I don't want to forget is um, the diet, which we'll uh, get to uh, again, is we're talking about uh, kids that really haven't responded to drug therapy. 
Uh, and that varies from physician to physician is when you would consider the, uh, the ketogenic diet. Now, in theory, uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, have said that um, after two or three drugs that fail miserably in a kid or uh, even an adult that's having a lot of seizures, the diet needs to be at least mentioned. Uh, now, fortunately, I don't often have to mention the diet, thanks in part to the Atkins diet, because people start to look at that for other reasons, and then they hit upon a lot of uh, websites talking about the ketogenic diet, not even enough necessarily in reference to epilepsy. Uh, and they may bring it up, uh, and that's uh, perfectly great. Uh, we always want to know what the options are, and then we kind of decide on the indications and uh, when to kind of recommend it. Also, um, obviously the diet, diet itself is not particularly curative. Uh, so if uh, it's a little bit controversial, but if I have a patient and let's say the drugs are not working and uh, we can identify the cause of their seizures, the location of the seizures in the brain, and it's potentially surgically amenable, then I put that to forefront because that may be potentially curative. And we want to be able to identify that earlier. Um, when you're talking about the ketogenic diet, even when it works, great, they're committed to the diet for a considerable period of time, one, two, three years. Um, and many times, even if you have a great result uh, and you're still getting, say, 10% of the seizures they used to have, if the seizures are drop attacks or they're convulsive, you're still facing a lot of medications um, and you're then, then looking at the diet as a supplement or as an adjunct to their existing treatment. So we're going to run through also attempts to analyze the diet by various investigators trying to liberalize the ketogenic diet. But generally still at our institution, uh, we look at the ketogenic diet as the first uh, uh, course of action to basically uh, determine its effect. Um, the most of the data surrounding uh, dietary therapy is with the ketogenic diet. But we're starting to get more data uh, looking at these more modified versions that are pretty favorable. Uh, the medium chain triglyceride, triglyceride diet um, was basically proposed in 1971. Uh, and really, the only difference uh, with the ketogenic diet is that you're substituting medium chain triglycerides as another fat source because um, per weight, MCT has uh, more ketone uh, that you can drive out of it by the body, so it's more efficient. So you can, if you incorporate MCT into the diet, then you don't need as much overall fat volume or weight, uh, which I may not be as good as uh, uh, Nicole Tracy when it comes to how we measure these things. Maybe grams, I should say. Um, uh, there are some side effects to it. Uh, in particular, you may get more uh, cramping, uh, abdominal bloating, maybe vomiting associated with using MCT oil. But so originally, uh, it was proposed that 60% of your uh, fat calories is from MCT. But now it's been more 45, 40% uh, as a, more as uh, in combination with the long train triglycerides. Uh, the, uh, the way to get MCT uh, is uh, there are actually three ways. There's these uh, formulations that are available. Uh, you can get them at health uh, food centers. They're pricey. Uh, for instance, uh, the one on the right uh, is the oil is like 14, 15 bucks for a 32 ounce bottle. Uh, the one on the left is, I believe, more expensive, which is an emulsion. They're used in, a, in, a, uh, in slightly different ways when you're preparing meals. Another source of MCT is coconut oil, okay, uh, which incidentally is used in other countries as um, you know, uh, a, uh, something you put in your hair as a moisturizer. Uh, you can get them in Mediterranean stores and, and Whole Foods. And Mediterranean stores is actually far cheaper, like a third cheaper. Um, almost like yeah, something you use for hygiene because it's uh, considered like a, um, a body deodorant in countries that really that's their only source for things that might smell good rather than conventional deodorant. <laughs> um, but it's perfectly healthy. Uh, you can, it looks like Crisco uh, unless you warm it up and it's just an oil and you can spoon it out and add it to um, uh, the diet in general to get your MCT. But coconut oil is still a little pricey too. So the modified Atkins diet, um, they're all the same indications. Modified Atkins diet, the, um, uh, the MCT uh, treatment, and then we'll mention also the low glycemic index uh, diet or treatment. They're all the same indications as a ketogenic diet. Um, and, but with the modified Atkins diet, it may be more suitable in older kids uh, who are cynical and can't really tolerate a ketogenic diet. Birth may be older than five years of age sometimes. 
as someone who's really aware and is used to uh, carbs. Uh, it's a little more uh, uh, liberal, but you're still restricting carbs almost to the same degree. Um, you're not restricting protein intake, uh, doesn't restrict calories so much. You still have to give calcium uh, and multivitamins. Uh, we're still doing the same kind of blood work. It started as an outpatient. Uh, sometimes what I do is I have a packet that I can give to the patient. Um, I explain a little bit about what we, what we do with it, but the packet is sort of self-taught and self-started. Much like people who are interested in doing the, modify, or the regular Atkins diet, you kind of learn about it. Uh, sometimes you can have weight loss, then you have to just increase the, the amount of calories that they consume. But the same mechanism of the ketogenic diet. Basically, uh, you're, getting, you're forcing the body to utilize uh, the ketones that are produced uh, by fat intake as its uh, key energy source. There were some studies, in the interest of time, I'm just going to mention them briefly. Um, it's been looked at, and particularly in Johns Hopkins, by uh, a colleague of mine who's been very helpful to me, is uh, Eric Kossoff. And uh, he has found it really beneficial, and it rivaled in his, uh, in his uh, population to that of the ketogenic diet. Uh, we think the jury is still out. There's people in the field that think that it's not as effective as ketogenic diet. Um, we're not really sure what the difference could be. It could be the individual variation on how people respond to any particular dietary modification. But it's still a little bit of a question in my mind. Um, but if someone uh, comes into my office, it's an adult, uh, and they want to try it, it's, it's fair game for the most part. It's been looked at in children, too. Uh, and the uh, efficacy has been uh, pretty good. Uh, in some of these smaller studies, 65% of the children had greater than 50% reduction in seizure frequency. 35% uh, had greater than 90% improvement. Four patients uh, were able to be seizure free. Uh, these are short term studies, they're not that long. Uh, and there was no kidney problems or kidney stones. The cholesterol uh, increase was uh, pretty modest. Uh, in adults, we've had similar efficacy uh, data that has come out. Um, and some of these patients that were studied were pretty severe. They already had epilepsy surgery in many cases, or a vagal nerve stimulator were already implanted. So if you get an EF effect that's positive in a population that's been tried actually on all these other things, then that's pretty notable. So I have to admit, when I go through the data and look at all these studies in the last couple of years, uh, it's pretty exciting. Uh, so on the other hand, though, it's tempered by the fact that in the field, it's one of those things that I don't want to give people uh, false hope. But we, you know, we try it in the right circumstance, and we determine that case by case. Uh, there are very uh, individualized experiences that we have to sort of uh, grapple with. For example, uh, some people will, uh, had, well, my child started acting weird or irritable when the first few days of the diet. It's hard to know if that's diet or trying to accommodate and they don't like the diet, or maybe uh, uh, some other reasons, maybe they have some gastrointestinal upset and they're not able to vocalize. So it's really uh, you know, a little bit different than medications. Uh, we just don't have a vast population of patients who have had the diet that we can predict uh, with certainty the kinds of experience that individuals will have. So uh, finally, the low glycemic index uh, uh, treatment or diet. Uh, as a background, uh, there are some carbs that when you take them, your blood glucose doesn't rise that much, okay? Um, and other ones that rise uh, instantly, okay? And some uh, uh, carbs would surprise you as to what their effect is. Uh, and there's been an index that's been created to find which carbs will raise your glucose uh, more than others, and it's a relative index. And there's even controversy when I talked to Nicole, my colleague here, um, you know, that the, that the, that the scale uh, is not a little, not, may not be that accurate. Uh, and as I looked into it, uh, the, the scales can actually vary in where they put uh, the, the, the foods, depending on the source. But as a reference, uh, it gives you the idea of what this diet is trying to do. Glucose is uh, 100. That's the, the most, with the exception of maltose. So if you take glucose, your glucose in your blood is going to rise, as you would expect, uh, quite rapidly. Um, now, uh, interestingly, sucrose, which is table sugar, your glucose doesn't rise that dramatically compared to glucose. Uh, and then in this table, uh, which I'll, I'll bring up, this will be the next slide, kind of show you how foods vary. Uh, but the idea is that foods with high glycemic index, uh, meaning refined carbs, 
produce substantial increases in blood glucose, insulin levels, and foods with low glycemic index, like meat, dairy, some fruits, some vegetables, and some unprocessed whole grains, um, will lower your post, will induce a lower postprandial glucose surge, or post-eating uh, surge of your glucose. The idea is by limiting the quality of car quantity uh, and particular carbohydrates consumed and restricting the sources of carbs to low um, GI or glycemic index foods, the, uh, it's designed to prevent the, the glucose, uh, dramatic changes in glucose levels. And so your brain in this particular diet is still going to be utilizing ketones because glucose availability is just not there. So it's still very restrictive. So in, in this chart, uh, if you look at glucose, of course, raises your sugar uh, higher, faster. But look at uh, potatoes, OK? And pota a potato raises your sugar much more than regular table sugar, which is a little surprising. And some of that has to do with how the intestines or the GI tract absorbs um, the carb and, and, and utilizes the sugar content. Uh, and, but there are a lot of things here that are low glycemic index that might have been uh, not uh, advised in the ketogenic diet. So it's, it is more liberal and more possibly more palatable. And there are um, colleagues uh, that, of mine that are strictly using this, uh, this particular diet for their patients now. Uh, in your packet, there's a lot of reasons to consider this, uh, which we mentioned. Um, but the idea is uh, you don't have to restrict carbs so much as restrict the glucose availability for your body to use that as a source of energy. Um, in your packet, uh, we go into some of the, uh, the justification for this uh, because there's some people just not so familiar with it and uh, people that have been reading about the ketogenic diet uh, that think that may not be able to be done in their family or their situation um, might want to be convinced before starting this. And there's good data to say that we, we uh, uh, can go with it. Uh, just as a more comparison between the uh, the low glycemic index diet or treatment versus the ketogenic diet, uh, with, compared to both, uh, it allows more liberal total carb carbohydrate intake, um, but you're going to stick with uh, low glycemic index foods that are way below uh, the level 50 on the chart. Uh, common side effects um, are similar to uh, KD or ketogenic diet, but you don't really expect to see pancreatitis, uh, calcium kidney stones, uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, constipation as much. Uh, interestingly, the diets have been looked at uh, in diabetics, and of course, because diabetics don't want a lot of glucose uh, surge in their blood, they have a very, very a, a pretty favorable physiological impact to diabetics. Meals are easier to prepare. You're not having to measure on a gram scale, and that's similar to the modified Atkins diet. You don't have to measure foods. You're basically looking at uh, uh, the relative portions. Uh, it's more palatable. Uh, there are fewer um, psychosocial challenges, particularly in teens or adults, because you're actually are going to be able to eat uh, more readily in, outside of your own home because the availability of certain foods that you can incorporate are not as restricted. Also, like the uh, uh, modified Atkins diet, it started as an outpatient. We don't have to hospitalize somebody for that. Um, in the interest of time, again, I'm not going to go through the studies. There have been a couple of few, very few studies. Uh, but in theory, and coupled with the studies, it's starting to become a little more compelling. And uh, I expect to see more studies on the way to give me more confidence that maybe this may be the way to go for a lot of patients. OK, so overall conclusions about dietary modification. Um, the efficacy of the diet is as good, if not better, than a lot of the anti-epileptic drugs. But it's mainly because the anti-epileptic drugs are easier to use and more practical that we go with drugs first. Uh, there are limited side effects, uh, although not side effect free. People really need to understand that uh, it's a diet that has pharmacological properties as well as biochemical changes in the person's body. Um, although it may be looked upon as more natural, uh, it's possibly and more often less expensive than a medication. Uh, because you're just uh, changing your food choices. Um, lack of drug-drug interactions, obviously, because it's not a, really a drug in the conventional sense. You don't have to worry about insurance coverage, um, for the most part, because some things uh, in terms of the, the workup and the evaluation, obviously, in the clinic and the hospitalization has to be covered. Um, 
And there may be some improvements in awareness and alertness. And if you, we always look for opportunities to try to reduce the medication load on somebody, particularly in kids or adult patients who are on a medication that is known to be sedative. These are some resources. It's not in your packet, but some of these you, uh, uh, in this audience I know you're very familiar with, but people who may be watching the video may not know. Uh, the Trolley Foundation is an excellent resource. It's really dedicated to um, promote the ketogenic diet. Uh, and they have links to reliable sources of information. And the people that sit on the board are highly reliable and reputable. The Epilepsy Foundation and epilepsy.com also has, uh, of course, vast uh, array of um, uh, information about epilepsy in general and treatments, but in particular they have articles about ketogenic diet. Uh, in the Charlie Foundation website in particular, uh, there's a link to all the hospitals that are registered and comfortable to be able to do the diet at, by state. Uh, so if people watching the video can also check to see if their state and in their state what center may be able to do that. Um, as a, uh, one quick announcement is that uh, the Epilepsy Foundation is, in conjunction with the Charlie Foundation is having a symposium that is more medical for physicians coming up in September, but there's a day program for families. It, it seems to be kind of similar to this. Uh, they may be addressing things uh, a little bit differently, but that's another way to get additional information. And also the Trolley Foundation has an uh, uh, updated list of events that are strictly talking about dietary therapy. Okay, for that, uh, that, we'll leave it at that, and thank you very much.